Hello everyone and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just and context-specific way. I'm your host Aristide from Metabolism of Cities and in today's episode we will talk about complex adaptive systems, Kleiber's law, and how it is possible to predict based on the size of cities, how many patents it's produced, how long are all of its roads, or how many violent crimes have been committed. I can imagine that you might be lifting an eyebrow right now, but rest assured, um, all of this is possible. And we have an expert to explain all of this. I have distinguished Professor Jeffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, and Geoffrey is a physicist that has worked on particle theory at the beginning of his career and then shifted on focusing on power laws and scaling laws in biology and later on in uh, urban systems and we'll see how that uh, is possible. He has uh, written all of this and you can find all of these information in his book, Scale, uh, The Universal Laws of Life, Growth and Death in Organism cities and companies. Just before we kick off, uh, I'd like to make a small request from you. I'd like for you to share this podcast with everyone that you think would find this interesting. So you can do that by re reviewing it on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or even on, on YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube. With all that being said, hi Geoffrey and welcome to this podcast. Uh, thank, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you, Aristide. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I Looking forward to our conversation. Uh, my name, as you said, is Jeffrey West, and I'm a, a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, and I am a physicist by training. I mean, as you said, spent much of my career thinking about quarks and gluons <laughs> and string theory and dark matter. And uh, in more recent years, some bi biological questions. And now I've become very seriously interested in cities and companies and sustainability. and some of the big questions we're facing on the planet. I'm wondering how how one uh, shifts uh, from, you know, <laughs> <laughs> particle theory to to biology. Um, I mean, you have some explaining here saying that before going to biology, you were interested in life and death in general, some uh, philosophical questions, and that perhaps led you to, to biology or your shift to biology? Yes, well, I, I'll try to keep it brief, but yes, uh, um, you know, I, I, I've always been interested in sort of some of the big questions. I mean, sort of, you know, high school questions, <laughs> you know, what is life, <laughs> the meaning of life, you know, what is, etc. And, and um, you know, and that's in a way why I got originally into high energy fundamental physics. I think, you know, that these are the most fundamental questions in a way in the physical world, but uh, and as much as I enjoyed it and so on, it, it of course doesn't answer some of the even bigger questions. I mean, the origin of the universe is a big question, but, but you know, it doesn't uh, somehow our place in relationship to that, maybe. And um, so some of those kinds of questions. So that's always been there. And, uh, but uh, it, the shift took place uh, mainly in the uh, 90s. Uh, the 1990s and I was in my 50s and uh, beginning to be conscious of my own age and as you sort of intimated I've always had a sort of morbid interest in death uh, you know <laughs> you know it's always fascinated me um, and um, I uh, I became interested in my own uh, aging and mortality partially because I happened to come from um, a family of short-lived males. You know, most, uh, most of the males in my family die in their 50s and early 60s. My father died when he was 61, my grandfather when he was uh, 57, and so on. So I, I grew up uh, with this idea that uh, my, I was expected to die in my, uh, at best in my early 60s. And here I was in my 50s, <laughs> and it didn't look very far over the horizon. <laughs> and I became very interested in that question. And, uh, you know, it turned out it was a time when there was a lot of turmoil in uh, 
high energy physics to do with the building of the superconductor, supercollider. And uh, one of the things that was uh, sort of being quoted a lot at that time was um, a sort of an attack on physics that, uh, you know, this, this statement that I'm sure you've heard and many of you listeners also, that um, physics, was, um, physics was the science of the 19th and 20th century and uh, biology will be the science of the 21st century. Well, I, I heard that, but I also heard the corollary that was, therefore, there's no need to do any more physics. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, I reacted very strongly to that, knowing nothing about biology, by the way, saying that, um, well, biology, yes, obviously biology is going to be a, a major, if not the major, major science of the 21st century. But it isn't going to be a serious science unless it starts to somehow absorb some of the paradigm methodology and ways of thinking of physics. So this was a very arrogant. <laughs> I can uh, imagine it was well received, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was typical, by the way, of the physics community, by, I mean, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it, uh, but, so I would, I react to this in this way. And then sort of one day I thought, you know, if I believe that, maybe I should sort of put money where my mouth is and start thinking <laughs> about biology. You know, is it really true? I mean, I don't know. Um, and, and since I had this interest in mortality, um, I thought that would be an interesting place to start. And um, I learned very quickly something that surprised me. Uh, two things I learned. Uh, one thing was that uh, this despite death being the, probably the second most important event in an organism's life, after its birth, of course, um, if you looked in biology books, textbooks, there was always no mention of mortality or, you know, why you die. I mean, it was just sort of wasn't, and there was a, there was a lot about, you know, reproduction and birth and life history and so on. Uh, but uh, essentially nothing. I could find nothing. And I even went to the literature, spent time in libraries in those days. I mean, there's still real libraries. <laughs> it would be much easier today when you could yeah. Google. But I went, uh, this is the 90s. Um, and I discovered uh, looking at the literature that it was pretty poor. It was sort of a backwater of biology. And then I also learned uh, something that uh, was a question I had asked myself, not only why do we age and die, but what sets the scale of lifespan? Why, why a hundred years? Why not, uh, you know, a thousand or a million or, you know, why are we all dead by 10 years? What is it? And um, so that was one thing I realized that biologists don't think in those terms. And secondly, um, and by the way, we're going to talk about cities. When I got into cities, I discovered People doing, I don't know, urban science, I don't know what you want to call it, but thinking about cities and urban Oh, sorry, don't think in that, or well, haven't been thinking in those terms. You know, setting, asking those more quantitative questions. But um, maybe we'll come to that in a little bit. But um, so uh, the other thing I, this, I learned uh, was that um, I realized that if you, if you want to understand why something dies, you've got to understand what's keeping it alive in the first place. And therefore, what's gone wrong? You know, what's happened? That the, the, the mechanism for sustenance is somehow degraded. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I uh, realized that that was to do with metabolism. And then I learned that there were these, by just reading books, there were these extraordinary scaling laws in biology in principle, mostly, I mean, the most famous thing to do with metabolism, we'll talk about that. And, and that relates to metabolism of a city, ultimately, but metabolism for an organism. And there were these extraordinary scaling laws, which I found amazing because they were, they were quantitative and uh, there was data. And they were amazing because who would believe that the most complex phenomenon in the universe, which is uh, which is evolving and adapting, where everything about the system we believe uh, is is historically contingent. I mean, every every organ in your body, 
every cell type, every genome depends on its history. I mean, that's natural selection and evolution. So if you, if you believe that and you plotted anything, you'd see these points sort of, you know, not necessarily randomly, but spread all over the graph because that would reflect the, the fact that it's been historically contingent, accidents happen. Uh, it's sort of a random process out there. So they would be, and here they were, these lines, the, these points lying beautifully on, on one line. I thought, my God, that's a, there must be, this must be a major area of biology. Yeah. Well, it had been, it had been in the, in, in, before the war, before the second world war, but the molecular evolution, the focus on what the elementary particles, so to speak, of biology and the discovery of the genetic code and blah, 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 had shifted attention completely away from it. And I learned there was no serious explanation of these scaling laws and had been forgotten. And I thought, oh, this is great. Here's something quantitative. Here's something that a physicist can think about and no one's thinking about it. So I can in the, you know, when I'm not doing quarks and gluons, I can think about this. And that's what got me going uh, in, in understanding. And the first problem that I worked on was indeed to understand um, the origin of the scaling of metabolic rate. And, uh, and once I got into that and I met up with some wonderful biologists and I collaborated with eventually, um, uh, my, I didn't realize at the time, it was not my intent, my uh, whole trajectory of my scientific career uh, gradually took a complete change of direction. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 it's totally serendipitous, totally, you know, unexpected. Like and an I evolution somehow, like, yeah. You know, I have been, I mean, I'm very lucky because I enjoyed it immensely. As much as I love thinking about string theory and fundamental questions in physics, where you know you work extraordinarily hard, and you have to be extremely clever, and if you're lucky, you make epsilon progress, uh, uh, which is usually not appreciated by your colleagues even. And suddenly there was this all this biology was sort of, I suppose in the language, almost low hanging fruit for a physicist. I felt, uh, which somehow had been neglected. So. That, that was uh, that was great, actually. It took a long time, by the way. I mean, I say it as if it was easy, but, uh, you know, the transition and actually doing some serious work took of the order of two years. So... That's I the think, background. Sorry, it's a long, a long story. I'm sorry, but that's... No, no, no. I think I, I want to go back to, to this. So what existed already, which you said back in the... Before the Second World War, I think you referred to Kleber's law. Uh, yeah, about so, exactly. Could, could you a bit elaborate what were these axes where he yeah. was looking at uh, this um, yeah. perfect line well, and what does it really mean? Yes, exactly. So uh, I'll talk about Kleber's law in a second, but the other thing I wanted to say was that many scaling laws were discovered uh, pre, uh, in, during the 30s and 40s into the 50s. Um, and they had been, and, and I was very into the 60s. And I was extremely fortunate that uh, three books had been written in the late 70s, early 80s as summaries by biologists of all these scaling laws without any explanation, but just, you know, talking about them. And with wonderful compendiums, like a compendium. And, and without that, I probably couldn't have done anything, just having all those. Anyway, so the, but the original law that started all this was discovered, I think it was 1932, by a man named Max Kleiber, who was a uh, biologist um, um, at the, what's now the University of California, Davis. Um, and he was, a, he was Swiss originally, but uh, he, he was interested in metabolism and um, he uh, was one of the first people to plot uh, logarithmic. You have to plot them logarithmically, whether you like it or not, because if you want to put a, a mouse and an elephant on the same graph, you can't do it with linear scale. So you have to plot them logarithmically, going up by factors of 10. Um, and he plotted them on a graph. He did some of his own measurements. And um, he found that they fit perfectly on a straight line and uh, essentially perfect. I mean, it's amazing, actually. And um, 
he also discovered that the slope of that line was very close to three quarters. And he just said, look, you know, the best fit is, you know, I think it was 0.745, but three quarters. And he pronounced, okay, three quarters. And there was actually a little argument at the time between biologists who think about, well, you shouldn't say that, you know. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> well, he got it right, as far as I'm concerned. He said three quarters. And um, so, uh, and, and that's, again, just to repeat what I said, it's sort of amazing because um, uh, each one of those organisms and each subsystem, each cell type, each genome, of course, has this uh, historical contingency, and yet they line up on this, this line. That was the first thing. So I had this curious number three quarters, not two thirds, which would be the most naive. Well, the most naive, of would course, be one. Is, yeah. linear, is yeah. linear, that you yeah. double the size of an organism, you have twice as many cells, it goes linearly. Well, it was clearly not linear. And then you'd say, well, maybe two thirds, sort of Galilean argument, <laughs> you know, heat loss and what. But you know um, that that's so simplistic. And why would why would natural selection sort of do something geometric? You know, what's the what's the biology is supposed? That's its fundamental premise: is natural selection and survival of the fittest. Why would some geometric thing like that evolve? So, and he realized that, and he showed on his graph, uh, his original graph, a linear, a two thirds, and a three quarters. And uh, that uh, the three quarters was the one that was uh, was the best fit. Um, so the other thing about that three quarters is that it's less than one sublinear, and uh, that therefore um, I, I don't. He did not emphasize this, as I as I recall. Um, but that that means that the bigger you are, the less energy is needed to support a unit mass of a cell, a gram of bio tissue uh, or at a cellular level, the bigger the organism, systematically, uh, the less energy is needed per cell. In fact, scaling, you know, so put it in terms of the metabolic rate of a cell within the organism that is in vivo, um, uh, decreases as mass to the one quarter power. Uh, it's in the three quarters means that the mass is increased, uh, the metabolic rate is increasing as mass to the three quarters. So there was this systematic economy of scale, um, which meant that, um, you know, our cells are working um, less hard than your dogs, but harder than your horses, I mean, so to speak, uh, in a systematic, predictable way. Um, so he did that. And then um, following that, as I said, during the, the following years, uh, people measured all kinds of things. And in fact, what they discovered was kind of remarkable. They, any physiological variable you could think of, from heart rates to length of your aorta, to you know, diffusion rates of things in your body, all kinds of things, um, uh, through life history events, um, you know, how long you live, which is what I've become interested in, uh, but growth rates, um, uh, offspring, number of offspring, all scaled, in a in this simple way that is as a power law and the exponent the analog to the three quarters was always a simple multiple of one quarter always so there was this kind of extraordinary universality in biology across all scales and by the way um, it wasn't just mammals it was across all of life from um you know um, insects fish birds plants and trees i mean everything and then eventually down at the at the cellular level uh, in the 19 was that me measured as well at the cellular yeah, level measured yeah. at the cellular level that, okay. that cells uh, do, you know it was like this is kind of remarkable and um so this was all summarized as i said um, um in a uh, in a in a in two or three books um in in the by about 1980 i would say and so I came on the scene in the mid nineties, basically. And I had these books that, you know, was were really nice actually, because not only did they have all the data, but they, they were written, they were all pretty well written for a, in a non-technical way, even though they were technical books, actually, they were written for biology community, but they were, you know, they didn't go into much technicalities. So 
um, going back to my beginnings, I started thinking about uh, uh, mortality and recognizing that you need to understand metabolism. And here I needed to understand that. Oh, by the way, the other thing was that uh, one of the scaling laws that uh, among all those many of life history events was the scaling law for lifespan, which mm -hmm. scaled approximately as mass to the one quarter. Um, but, but lots of variants, by the way. I mean, lots of variant because uh, partly because data is hard to get and you don't have control of data. You know, there's zoo animals and animals in the wild who get killed because of predator prey dynamics and so on. So, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to have controlled experiments on that, so to speak. Nevertheless, um, you know, one quarter wasn't bad as a fit. And they, there's just a lot of, a lot of variants, as I say. So that was very, that was really intriguing that all this somehow fit together. And so, uh, but the first thing I wanted to do, do was to understand the scaling law for metabolic rate. And the thing that maybe coming out of physics, the thing that intrigued me was that uh, that's pretty weird that uh, metabolic rate for mammals should scale the same as fish, that should scale the same as trees. That can, you know, I mean, okay, they're all life, but they're very different. But there's one obvious thing about all of them, two obvious things, I would say, that are connected. One is they're all struggling with the same problem. They're all made of cells. There's an enormous number of cells. We have, what, uh, you know, uh, 100 trillion cells in our body, about 10 to the 14 cells. And they all have to be fed in some democratic way, an efficient way. And we know how that, that uh, what, 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 what uh, natural selection evolved. It did something obvious. It created these networks that do it. But that's true of all of these systems. They all have these networks. They all have this struggling with the same issue. Um, and so I thought, obviously, the one commonality across all of these and all scales is that it's something to do with these networks. So it must be that it's something to do with the mathematics and physics and the generic properties of these networks in terms of their structure and their dynamics. So I said, okay, let's just uh, create a model network. Uh, let's think of the, for example, our circulatory system and what do we learn? Because one of the things that um, uh, is in terms of metabolic rate, so metabolic rate is uh, as you mentioned when you were talking about cities in your introduction, is roughly speaking for an organism, how much food do you need per day to stay alive, basically? Um, it's not quite that because you have to metabolize that food, but effectively it is. Um, so it's the 2,000 or whatever it is, calories per day on the average that a human being needs to stay alive. And the question is, how does that scale across different organisms? Um, so, uh, you know, so the, 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 the basic question is, um, you know, what, how do you translate that into the sort of network language? Well, it turns out biologists have already done that because they don't actually measure directly the food you eat each day. What they measure, of course, what they, the way that you metabolize is uh, you use respiration, you use oxygen. To, to, to oxidize the food and turn it into metabolic energy, into ATP, which is your, the molecule that is your currency of energy. And so the way that it is measured is, um, uh, is by uh, your, the intake of oxygen in your, so your breathing, you just measure the respiratory rate. And you could also measure, if you could do it, the blood rate uh, through your aorta coming out of your heart would be the same thing because it's it's carrying the oxygen to the cells. Coming through the mouth is measuring the oxygen coming into the body. You can also measure, by the way, just a side comment, um, and it was done in the early days, measure just the heat, the heat that's coming off, because mm -hmm. that has to be a conservation of energy. Anyway, um, so that's great, because if it's the measure of, the, of what's coming through, flowing through the network, you have a network theory, you have to calculate what is the flow through a network and um, how does that, what happens if I change the size of the network? I mean, basically, well, it sounds simple, but it took a long time to <laughs> put that into mathematics. And the other, but the, the fundamental thing that you have to think about is 
what are the universal generic properties of the network that transcend design? Because you are not a tree. I mean, we both look like sort of fractal-like networks, but you know, our circulatory system and a tree are quite similar, but they're very different in an engineering sense because you are a bunch of tubes joined together, your circulatory system, but a tree is a fiber bundle, like an electrical cable that sprays out. So obviously, whatever the principles of the network are, they have to transcend the design. So they can't depend specifically on the kind of network. Um, and certainly if you went down to the cellular level or to insects, it's, a, it's again a different kind of system, even though they're still networks. So the, the ones that uh, we focused on in the end were, and I'll just say them because they are relevant when we come to cities. That is the first is something we call space filling. And uh, that just means what it almost is obvious that the network has to feed every cell. Um, every cell has to be serviced. The end of the network has to end close enough to the cell to supply it with oxygen. In the same way that a city has evolved so that every person or business, there's a roadway to get to it. Otherwise, it's not, it's not part of the city. I mean, it's almost by definition. In fact, it's a very good definition, I think, uh, maybe what a city is and what an organism is. It has to, you have to be connected to that network. So that's the first thing. And you have to put that into mathematics, which I'm obviously not going to talk about here. The second is that the terminal unit of the network, the last branch, so the capillary in the circulatory system, for example, is invariant, meaning um, a whale, um, an elephant, and a human being, if you looked at our capillaries, they'd be essentially the same. Um, and that's the idea is that in, in, in evolving new species of a mammalian species, uh, natural selection doesn't sort of reinvent the fundamental units. Um, you, you keep basically the same cells. Our liver cells are pretty much the same. You know, the, the cells, the capillaries, and so on, all are essentially the same. And you and the, the thing that makes us different is this, the network that is built up from those. In the same way, you could argue, I mean, this, you know, that um, all cities are, you know, have certain fundamental units. I mean, we have, all cities have people. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, the city is not a city unless it has people and they're the, they're the fundamental units. And, you know, you, you build cities based on people and we'll come to that. So there's that idea. And then the last one is the, the biggest assumption, but also by far the most powerful. And that is that these systems, um, because of the kind of continuous feedback mechanisms implicit in natural selection, kind of the survival of the fittest, um, have led to a, um, an approximate optimization of something. They've, you know, the ones that have survived and that now exist and have flourished are ones that have somehow optimized relative to the environment and their struggle of survival of the fittest. And so to put that into simple terms, uh, in terms of the context of these scaling laws, it's that, and the networks, it's that um, the, the, the structure of our circulatory system um, has evolved in order to minimize the amount of energy we allocate to our heart for pumping blood through the system to supply oxygen and nutrients to the cell. And the idea is we've minimized it, we sort of optimized the system so that we can devote uh, maximally energy to um, our Darwinian fitness, meaning to sex and reproduction and the rearing of offspring to pass on the gene. So that's, that was the idea that you minimize energy. And that's, it, for a physicist, that's, that's essential and powerful because then the task is you've got to solve the equations for flow, uh, within each tube of the network, you have to create a network and then with all its various parameters, and then you say, I'm going to optimize it by minimizing the energy that the, the pump is, is putting out to, to keep the system going. That's a long, 
tedious, complicated, challenging, but in principle, straightforward calculation. <laughs> but it took a year to do it. <laughs> and when you come out, when you finish with that, what was fantastic, oh, and then, by the way, then having done that, you say, now I'm going to change the size of the system. Yeah. <laughs> a given size. Now I'm going to scale and ask, how does it change? How do all these things change as I increase the size of the system? So when all that was done, um, what popped out was fantastic. It wasn't just that you got uh, a, um, a mathematical theory, predictive mathematical theory for the network, meaning not just the structure of the network, what the various lengths and radii of the tubes are, but also the flows in them. How much, how much blood is flowing in the eighth branch of a hippopotamus's <laughs> circulatory system? That's what you. That's what was solved. You know, it's not a very a very specific or, trivia <laughs> element. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> but so that's not so interesting. Well, it is. It's it could be interesting, but. <laughs> What was more interesting was that uh, the scaling, the, the three quarters popped out of the, that calculation. And um, that was very nice. And you could trace through why it was three quarters, where it came from. And, uh, and that's to do the three, by the way, is to do with the, uh, the space that you live in. We live in three dimensions. So that three, if we lived in two dimensions, that would have been a two. Um, uh, and the four was actually three plus one, because the dimensionality of space we live in, plus one, and in some sort of hand-waving way, which the equation showed you how to do it, uh, was because the, the, what the, the optimal configuration was um, an approximate fractal. That is this kind of self-similar behavior um, of, of our system. And the plus one, was sort of a manifestation of the maximal fractality of the system. And that was giving rise to this optimization of the system. So I'm not really explaining that the equations do it, but it's sort of a hand-waving way of explaining well why those numbers turned out the way they did. So in two dimensions, it would have been two thirds rather than mm -hmm. three quarters. But anyway, um, so that was very nice, but you know what, what was much more powerful in a way was that we now had a complete theory and now we can apply it to all these other, you know, there, there were, in those books that I mentioned, there were probably 50, 75 scaling laws of various things, and we could derive almost all of them um, from this so theory. Did you present any of that in a biology conference, and what was the reaction yes. back in the day? Yes, yeah, so it got, it got, uh, <laughs> it was interesting. Yes, it's been, uh, it's a whole area, actually, now that it became... It's, it's become known as the metabolic theory of ecology, funnily enough, which I don't like. That was because my major collaborator was a wonderful scientist named Jim Brown, who was a very well-known ecologist. He happened to be president of the American Society, American Society of Ecologists. I forget what they and whatever the professional name of it is in, in the United States. Um, he, uh, he was oriented towards ecology and uh, he gave this name, which I didn't like, but it's stuck. And so it's now a sort of area, little area of biology. So it got, it got very enthusiastic response in many quarters. And it got a lot of criticism <laughs> in others. I was waiting for the, yeah. <laughs> it, got, it got totally... Um, but I wouldn't say bimodal, there was probably a continuum, but it felt bimodal that some, you know, I mean, I hate to even say this, some were saying this deserves a Nobel Prize, to others saying this is a bunch of old rubbish, what has this got to, you know, etc. You know, this is, <laughs> and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and so on. And, uh, and what about this, what about that? Um, and it was amazing, because it was an extraordinary open support. In fact, there was an article written by a biologist, a very well-known biologist, Carl Nicholas at the Cornell, wrote, um, there were a couple of uh, kind of essays in Nature saying that this is Newtonian in the way it's attacking. I mean, it was embarrassing. <laughs> it was ridiculous, ridiculous hyperbole. But it was wonderful to get, uh, you know, that kind of uh, publicity and that kind of acknowledgement. 
On the other hand, there was a lot, there were criticisms, both uh, technically, which were wrong, uh, but there were criticisms, um, and, uh, but also just philosophically. Because biology um, has this long, funny thing. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole part of biology that sort of doesn't believe that physics really has much to do with it. And yet, at the same time, there's kind of what they call, not me, they call physics envy. So it's a very curious, so this created a little bit, well, it's sort of, I don't know if it's in the past, but it's long enough ago that, uh, you know. So in fact, funnily enough, I was asked, um, I don't know when, maybe in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, to give, there's a famous lecture at the Natural History Museum in London um, on Darwin's birthday, it's called the Darwin Birthday Lecture. And I was extremely flattered and honored to be asked to give this lecture, which was great. They then decided <laughs> that they should have someone at the end give sort of like a rebuttal, which I found bizarre, you know. And so this guy, I shan't name him, it's, uh, gave the, it was a well-known biologist, gave this absolutely um, weird reaction to it, which was, I mean, there was, in fact, fortunately, there were lots of people, we went to dinner afterwards, I with him and the others, and luckily, almost everybody was on my side. And say, you know, this is, so that was actually very nice. But but you see, but it's there, it's still there. I would say in the community I, that certainly exists. Um, but things have moved on. So, but I did get, as I say, from some of the most uh, distinguished biologists, uh, tremendous positive feedback, including, by the way, feedback that said you're going to get a lot of shit for this. Yeah, basically. I can imagine. No, from I mean, my colleague, you know. No, it's very interesting, and uh, and it was repeated to jump ahead to a lesser extent when we did the city work. Yeah, I'm curious about that because we <laughs> yeah. we'll come to that. We'll come yeah. to that. I have a and schizophrenic relationship. Things, yeah, yeah. One of the other things is what I realized is, and it's a shame because you know um, when that the first paper that was written, uh, which explained did this what I this calculation I just told and explained. Um, and did much more uh, was a paper for science and the science editor sent it out. It, it's the only paper I've ever had which had nine reviews. <laughs> that was really well, well done. And that <laughs> nine reviews went from this is, you know, a fundamental break, breakthrough. It solved a famous problem. It should get a Nobel Prize to that was one end. <laughs> one or two. The other end was under no circumstances should this be published in science. In fact, I don't think this paper, you know, deserves publication in any biological. I mean, things that were outrageous, actually, including one, you know, actually it was a later paper that said, you know, mathematics has no place, a referee saying no place in biology. You know, I mean, so it's pretty extraordinary. So, um, you know, it's, uh, but it got nine reviews and the paper was demoted the referee, the editor, who was terrific, by the way, said, uh, when he agreed, he said, look, I'm going to ignore, you know, this paper should be published, and we're publishing it. But originally, it was going to be one of those long papers in science, you know, and that was written that way. And he said, unfortunately, because of that, I think I'm, I'm going to have to pay some attention to the negative reviews. I'm going to ask you to cut the paper down <laughs> to, <laughs> to make... And we did, but the paper suffered. And it suffered for, for two reasons. One is I wrote it as a physicist, mm -hmm. because I didn't, I, I didn't appreciate the biological culture. And the second was it had to be cut back. And it would be much better to, in a certain sense, have started from the beginning. You, you know what I mean? And, and rewrote the paper from scratch, rather than cut piece here, cut there, and was very unsatisfactory. But the other thing I learned later, and this is certainly true when I got into more social sciences, is what constitutes an explanation is different in different sciences. And mm. that shocked me. 
that, um, and I still st struggle with that, that um, many biologists and social scientists think that statistical fitting and then use extrapolation is an explanation rather than what a physicist thinks and what I think science tells us, I'm going to be quite arrogant with this, that you need dynamics. And it's better to have, I think one of the things that physics taught us, better to have a model that isn't complete and may even be wrong in some aspects that explains some things to begin thinking about a problem that makes predictions that can be tested against data so you can iterate. Better to do that than just do mindless fits and be obsessed. And that's the thing I learned about biologists and people in the social sciences, including urban people, obsessed with statistics. P-values and R-squared and all the rest. Yes, but don't take them seriously for crying out loud. I mean, and that's my issue. And I've stayed that, and, I'm, and I, I would say that I'm, I feel more and more, even with my young collaborators, I'm a minority of one. <laughs> They're all, it's a standing joke. Uh, but, uh, I'm always belittling statistics, which is unfair. We obviously need statistics. I mean, that's obvious. Statistics are important and you need to have significance tests and all the right, obviously. But when you raise it to a level equal to a theory or a model, and not recognize that it's okay to have wrong models sometimes. It can't be, especially in these systems. Jesus Christ, I mean, it's amazing to get anything that, uh, I mean, these are some of the most complex phenomena in the universe. This is so much easier than understanding the origins of the universe. That's what's so extraordinary about this stuff. I mean, we understand more about the origins of the universe than we do about how a city works. <laughs> Pretty amazing. You use the word complex there. Before we go into cities, um, I know that in your book you say that we can't define uh, complexity <laughs> as we can't define life, uh, but when you see it, you know it is <laughs> or, that it is, right? Can yeah. you point some complex stuff to us and say, okay, that is complex? Yes, no, I think that's right. I mean, um, you know, a lot of people, of course, struggle with what is complexity and i don't know if i did it in the book but i certainly do it in um sort of the equivalent of summer school lectures um when i this because i try to introduce it by talking about what what is complexity to begin with and i often do it by first introducing simplicity what is simplicity i mean by that which is the opposite and uh to put it you know in one line Physics is simplicity. Physics is the science of simplicity. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, you can understand, you can, you know, let's face it, you can, I mean, in certain sense, you can encapsulate all of motion at the classical level in two equations that I can write down. Newton's second law of motion and the law of gravity. <laughs> and that's sort of, and you know, of course, or, or you can do all electricity and magnetism, all of, you know, what's going on here between us by writing down Maxwell's equations. So, you know, there, there are um, an, an extraordinary collapse of a huge amount of data and experiments and things, which amazingly we can encapsulate in this symbolic fashion with these equations that uh, capture their structure and dynamics. So, you know, uh, so simplicity is that um, uh, you can uh, write, you know, a small number of equations that give you to a very, to, to a great deal of accuracy, the motion and structure of the system. And after all, uh, the classic case of the solar system, um, you know, we can, uh, we know with extraordinary accuracy, uh, the motion of the planets, and, if he, the, and indeed the motion of all the satellites so that you and I can have this conversation. Um, you know, it's amazing, even including corrections due to general relativity. I mean, it's sort of amazing. That's simplicity. So it may be very complicated, 
so um, a, a Boeing 747 is extremely complicated, but it's maybe not complex in this language because, you know, there's sort of a book that Boeing aircraft company has that tells you how to build one, which means in principle, I could give it to you. And in principle, you could build a Boeing 747, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Now that's in complete contrast to understanding your brain or a city or an economy and so on, because these consist of enormous numbers of components, constituents, actors. As I said earlier, our bodies have uh, 10 to the 12, 100 uh, trillion cells. Um, cities have enormous numbers, often enormous numbers of people, but enormous numbers of components and um, uh, that, that make up the city. Uh, they have a dynamic that involves not just the infrastructure, but all the complications of uh, social interactions, all the love and the hate and the politics and so on. And most importantly, they're continuously adapting and evolving. And that and over relatively short periods of time, especially in the case of city, not so much in biology, but they have built into them this question of adaptation and evolution and uh, some, some form of natural selection. And, and that's completely absent from the physical, the world of physics, let's call it that, and the world of simplicity. And, and that leads to these multiple scales, not that you don't have multiple scales in physical systems, but these emergent multiple scales that happen from out of the dynamics. I mean, a city is a great example because you have scales from you know the individual household, the individual person, all the way up to groups and dynamics and then the entire city. And um, all of those coexist and they interface strongly with each other. Um, and um, you know you can't uh, you can't think of a individual human being disconnected from a social network and therefore disconnected from the idea of city. I mean, it may be a very small town or a village, but we are in communities, and so that's all intertwined. And it's very hard to um, how should I say separate scales in a complex system. Extremely difficult. Whereas in physical systems it tends to be much easier. So there are all these characteristics, so we can describe them. And in, when I give a lecture, I try to give various examples. Um, but to give a precise definition, I think is extremely difficult. And, it, and, and as you said, you know, it, it's a bit like trying to define life. I think life in some ways may be easier to describe than complexity because complexity, life is just one aspect of complexity. Um, complexity has become um, something you know that involves all these uh, these these remarkable systems that have evolved on the planet. I mean the the planet. I mean it's so interesting to me having uh, spent most of my career doing um, uh, elementary particle physics and a little bit of astrophysics and so on. That um, you know the physical world is so is simple and we can understand the cosmos, <laughs> write down the equations, <laughs> understand the formation of galaxies and so on. But, you know, on the planet, it's messy. It's the messy world of the planet. On here, something very special occurred, um, presumably elsewhere, maybe, um, but something very special. And there's this great big mess, which looks random, chaotic, arbitrary, capricious, and the thing that's so exciting is to find that underlying that, there are apparently some regularities and commonalities like these scaling laws. And that's what I got excited about um, in terms of the biology and then trying to extend those ideas to cities to ask underneath what seems to be an arbitrary mess that seems to be contingent upon in city case, uh, city case geography, culture, history, you know, individual behavior and so on. Amazingly, there's some regularities. And that's very exciting because maybe we can start making a science of these things, a science in the sense of physics. I'm not saying the rest is the science, but uh, a more quantitative science. And that's where I'm coming from in attacking this. 
And this is specifically the reason I wanted you uh, on this podcast to discuss oh. exactly about this uh, and on scaling laws in cities. Um, I also have to dedicate this uh, this podcast episode to my dear friend and colleague Joao, who who passed away uh, two years ago, and he was doing his PhD research on scaling laws in cities. Oh my god! And uh, he was focusing on looking at the environmental footprints of cities and how to look at um, the how can we apply the scaling law lens and is the environmental footprints of cities reducing if we increase the size of cities and things like that. So yeah. this is a particularly oh, <laughs> emotional. Very good, very good. You know, I, I, um, that's been a backdrop for a lot of this work, actually. Uh, much bigger is the thing that I'm, uh, bigger backdrop is just the whole question of sustainability, global sustainability and, and the interface between um, understanding urban systems and ecosystems and therefore biology is ultimately a crucial component of that. And even though I thought about it, I haven't worked on it, which is amazing, even though I've been part of proposals to, to do this and so on. And, um, uh, and, and it's one of those things that uh, has stayed not on the back burner, sort of on a middle burner, ready to cook. And I've never really got into it. Um, and I feel sort of badly about that. And partly, and we maybe will come to this later on, partly because I, equally important is, um, I think what I got focused on was this question, which is even bigger than that, was this question of, is it even conceivable that the socioeconomic system that we have evolved, which is most represented in fact by cities, I mean, cities are the epitome, in a way, of, of what that means. Um, are they, in fact, sustainable long term? I mean, is the whole system as a system actually sustainable? And uh, that I became obsessed with that. Um, and the idea that part of that system invokes, and again, maybe we'll talk about it, the speeding up of time and uh, what that does to us. And so I became more focused on that than on this coupling between the environment and cities, which is a, a part of that. Um, but that's very sad what you told me that um, he was, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that he was working on it. And, I, I will send you some of his paper and think he will be extremely happy. Yeah, uh, Already true. that we have this conversation, I think he, he would be smiling and oh. would be listening. Um, and we had this intense conversation as well with another friend, Eve about this dichotomy or schizophrenia that I had, that I have this engineering background where I love quantitative assessments of cities. Uh, and on the other hand, I have an urbanist background, which oh. kind of tends to dismiss all of these. Yes. <laughs> and, That's what we were saying earlier. No, it's yeah, so interesting. Exactly. And, and it's always oh, such a difficult uh, yeah. experience reading your work because I, I love the idea of having this simplicity of these equations, yeah. as you mentioned them. Uh, but at the same time, I'm saying to myself, how is it even possible to have this complex system, which is a city, which is a layer of economy, ecology, politics, culture, and all of that, and we can mm -hmm. simply have a, a simple solution to it. And yes. so I'm schizophrenic about it. Can you yes, help well, me? I, I'm, I, I, you know, I certainly appreciate that. And I, and because I've been now sort of part of, or at least peripheral to the sort of um, urban science community, and, I've, and by the way, one of the things that I've enjoyed, and well, let me say something else first, actually. So I really, the work, I love the biology and I've loved the work on cities tremendously. It uh, came as a surprise to me. And I, I, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and, and the biggest surprise was that when I got into the city stuff, I thought it was gonna be boring. <laughs> I thought cities were boring. I didn't know anything, you know, and I was shocked once we got into it, uh, you know, I, I just, I was amazed and, and it really opened my eyes. And especially because I very quickly realized that the future of the planet is the cities. And, and I was shocked that I didn't realize that and even more shocked that the world doesn't know it. I mean, <laughs> the, and, and the academic world doesn't know it. I still, I mean, I, I still get so 
uh, frustrated and angry that all the talks about sustainability and global warming and so on still hasn't recognized the crucial role of the cities and therefore that you need to understand that. It's not just, you know, it's all very well saying, yes, it's the cities and it's people, but you need to understand it. And I think that's, that's my frustration. So, um, uh, but as I've got into the community and I've given lots of talks at um, city conferences where I, I'm one of about three academics. I mean, these are, you know, practitioners, politicians, I don't know, more urban planners and architects and so on, who come from a non-science background, typically, um, or ec economists, maybe. Um, I've appreciated more and more uh, this schizophrenia that you talk about. And I, and I, and in fact, um, one of the things I realized quite near the beginning, once I had this kind of epiphany about, um, you know, the role of cities was that I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned that my papers get published or published in high profile journals. That's good. Of course, I'm an academic. That's nice. But that's much less important than trying to interface with practitioners. And because the question, the obvious question might be as a practitioner, so what? You know, I mean, well, it's a silly, I think that's a silly response, frankly, but I recognize it. And it, it comes from this schizophrenia. And um, so one of the things that helped me in that, and I did talk about this in the book, and you know it much better than I, is that, uh, you know, if you look at cities that have been designed ab initio, they're almost always failures. They're soulless, they don't work, people are upset, they're not happy. And it takes, you know, Washington DC, it's taken a hundred years for it to become a place that everybody hates to a place that's now quite exciting, you know, a very, very interesting place to visit, lots of young people, lots of activity. But when I visited it 30, 40 years ago, <laughs> it was still a dead, oh, this terrible place. And so they speak of Brasilia and Islamabad and Canberra. They all have the same. And that is testament, in my view, from my perspective. That's because these cities were designed without understanding how cities really work. What, what is the science of cities? At least, you know, really coming to terms in a quantitative, principled way. Now, not that I'm saying I've done that, that's for sure, <laughs> but that we need to. We need to start to develop that. And I was particularly struck, and I did talk about this in my book, when um, Norman Foster, the architect, was designing this uh, city in the desert, Muslim, which you know probably more about than I, and, and he drew a square. And I thought, I, I was going to use a, a four-letter bad word, but I won't. But I thought, you must be kidding. I mean... A square city, it's almost, it already tells you that there's something going to be terribly wrong with this place to begin with. And indeed, when I was there, I realized there was something terribly wrong. And now it'll evolve, you know, like everything. It's, it's an evolve. The fact that you don't, you haven't recognized a priori any of these laws and any of these things. And the fact that you don't realize that it's an evolving organic beast is 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 a terrible i mean great cities are great because they've been around a long time and they've worked organically and they form they have formed the emergent laws that we're going to talk about the scaling laws and so on so so in answer to your question look these scaling laws and the laws that are related to them about the various networks and so on are a um are of course approximate. They're they're coarse, what we call coarse grain. Um, they're not precise, but they are at work, and they work in a statistical sense. And if you're going to build a city, or work on developing parts of the city, you better know those laws. Why work against them when those laws are going to be in effect? Because 
Those laws have come about because of the organic nature of social interactions and people interacting with their infrastructure. And so put that in at the beginning, try to work with it when you're designing a city or mitigating a problem in a city, recognize that. And so at a minimum, be aware of them. And, um, and I think that's sort of in a, in a nutshell, sort of the lesson of this. Um, and so I've, I've talked a lot with, you know, um, developers, construction people, you know, politicians and so on, uh, these various things. I'm still very frustrated that it's hard to get, get it really together because the cultures are so different. And, you know, I mean, the worst possible case is probably China now, I suspect. China is going to have, it already has tremendous problems with these new cities, cities that it's building. And it has to build them, it has to build, you know, I, I'm very empathetic. They have to build, you know, a couple of two or 300 new cities of a million people in the coming years, which is absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> but they just build them, you know, what I, I used to say, you know, Soviet style, you just sort of build. I mean, you don't sort of think, you just build these, and it's sort of like, you know, not recognizing that human beings live in them. I mean, let's put it in simple terms, that cities, I mean, that was the other thing I learned um, as I got into this, was I didn't realize that uh, much of the talk about cities and stuff written about cities, think of them as, as infrastructure, not recognizing that the infrastructure is just a background and a stage and a kind of machine for creating social interaction. And, uh, you know, um, and I realized I had inadvertently come to the same conclusions that the wonderful, brilliant Jane Jacobs had come to intuitively uh, in, in, a, in a highly non-scientific flaky way, but brilliant insight. Uh, and I, you know, I reread the book. I read that book, I think, not seriously, just because it was a book that was around, you know, I don't know, 40 years ago. I read Lewis Mumford and Jane Jacobs when I was probably 20 years old or whatever it was, 30 years old, I don't know, just as a cultural, you know, books that you read. Uh, I'd completely forgotten. They probably stayed back here in my head somewhere. But then I reread um, Jane Jacobs. And uh, I was... Of course, with a title like that, I I'm sure you would have... It has the keywords that you were looking for, sure. the, the life and death of... Yes, I mean, of it's city. extraordinary. No, yeah. I realized, I felt, my God, and, and I have to say, I, I, I forgot, you know, I, I was using those words, and then I suddenly realized, my God, of course, that's Jane Jacobs. <laughs> I better go back and reread, which I did. So um, <clears throat> that, was, that was great fun. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'm sort of, you know, labbing on here, but... Um, It is a big issue, the one that you've raised, um, which is not important in biology, which I talked about mm -hmm. earlier, this, this sort of two cultures phenomenon. Um, it, it's not important because it doesn't have, it only has academic consequences. This one, um, I fear, has serious consequences that, we, uh, that uh, I think we do need to somehow integrate this sort of more science-y, physics-y approach, or at least see how far it can be taken with traditional approaches. So I see it as purely complementary. It is in no way replacing anything. It's simply complementary and providing another lens uh, to look at what is a fundamental problem facing society. And, uh, you know, and I, 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 I think we, we need to somehow in culture of that in some way and i hope we can so before we get to how we can use scaling laws to plan and to think about our global sustainability challenges perhaps we can spend just a moment so that you explain what your discoveries yes. were with uh, your colleagues yes. such as louis betacourt and all of that yes. and i i enjoyed for instance one of the findings that said that if you have a 10 million inhabitant city, it would have 15% less infrastructure than two 5 million inhabitant cities. So that's mm -hmm. one very striking element. Could you 
perhaps present some some others. Yes, absolutely. So let me say about the scale because we've talked about them and yet haven't, <laughs> but haven't actually said what they are, <laughs> other than the implication that there are laws which are quantitative and in a certain, in that sort of coarse grained statistical way, predictive. So um, just historically, um, you know, I, I, I was working on this uh, with this biology and it, with the collaboration of several, you know, several young people and so on. But it became very obvious that um, um, since it was a network based theory, that um, it's obvious to try to extend it to social organizations and in particular cities and companies. And um, cities were much easier because data was public. Um, I was more interested in the beginning in companies, um, but that data is very hard to get and is, in fact, it's still a problem. But city data, by and large, is, is available. And we started a new collaboration. Um, and uh, that's when, as you mentioned, in particular, Louis Betancourt uh, joined, and that was fantastic. But um, the, the difference to begin with was that um, unlike the biology where I came in stone cold, uh, there were books that had summarized all the data. Here, I came in, well, stone cold <laughs> for cities, but not stone cold in terms of knowing what needed to be done. I had a, now a vision and- uh, You had it tested it once and it had worked, so you, you're, yeah, you knew exactly. what you were looking for, yeah. Yeah, exactly, I had a template this is what we're going to do. And so the first thing was do cities scale. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, after all, the biology had said, look, the whale lives in the ocean, the elephant has a trunk and the giraffe a long neck, and we walk on two legs and the mouse scurries around. They look quite different in many ways. Most ways, they look different. Yet, if you measure anything, uh, pretty much, they're all, we're all scaled versions of one another, non-linear, uh, by these quarter pals, but we're actually scaled versions of one another. Uh, and the question is, is New York a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, um, even though they're different geographies, histories, cultures, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, the only way to answer that is to, you know, to get data. Now, uh, and, and uh, Luis joined, and then was it Lobo and so on. Um, and uh, they did the work, not me. Uh, they put together, they got the data, and um, actually it's not quite true. Before then, there was a preliminary to that because I worked with, I don't know if you know him, uh, Dirk Helbing. Do you know Dirk Helbing at ETH, ETH in Zurich? He's no, a, I read in the book, but I don't know. Yeah, so Dirk is, uh, was a physicist, but he, he spent uh, much of his career on uh, urban transportation and he had an institute, and then he moved to ETH, and he works on social questions, social problems, social science, mostly. But he and I had talked, and he, the two of us and the student, I talked to him about this whole program, uh, and uh, we did some preliminary work in which uh, we looked at, uh, let's see, the ones I remember in that first, it was the very first paper on scaling in cities, which is really, um, cited, unfortunately, but it had um, the number of petrol stations mm -hmm. as a function of city size. And then I showed a picture in the book and the number mm -hmm. of restaurants, the things like that, all things. And they were, th you know, the, the, this work was done prior to Google really being hugely yeah. useful. So, um, uh, you know, we had to go out and get yellow pages, can you believe it, and count, anyway. <laughs> uh, um, inf investigative work, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was exactly. Uh, and we saw these wonderful scaling laws, and that was fantastic. And that gave impetus to uh, putting together a, super more, uh, a broader collaboration. And uh, then Luis and Jose in particular uh, got together this further data. And to cut a long story short, we discovered that uh, just as with the gas stations, the petrol stations, uh, uh, the infrastructural quantities scale just like biology because they're networks, they're physical networks. 
electrical lines and roads and so on, buildings even. Um, and that they scaled in a similar way. They certified power laws. Uh, you plot them log log and they are straight lines. There's, little, there's more variance than there was in biology. Not surprising, cities haven't been around that long compared to organisms, so, okay. But they showed very strong evidence of scaling uh, and they showed economies of scale. That is the slopes were sublinear. They were less than one. The only difference was the uh, slopes were 0.85 instead of 0.75. That was the only basically for infrastructure. And we also learned which was very satisfying, that wherever we could get data across the globe, it looked the same. So there was, again, this kind of universality in the infrastructure with this 0.85. So we also then looked uh, at um, socioeconomic quantities, which are the very essence of a city, much more than that infrastructure, um, the number of patents produced, uh, the um, amount of crime, about uh, the number of uh, flu cases and that disease and so on, all the things that involve social interaction. And we discovered something new, and that was that they scaled superlinearly, meaning that the slopes, they still satisfied power laws, straight line on the log log part, uh, but the slopes were bigger than one, which meant that in contrast to biology and in contrast to infrastructure, namely, the bigger you are, the less you need per capita, exactly what you said a moment ago, that if you take a city of 10 million people, it requires less infrastructure than systematically and predictably, from this viewpoint in this statistical way, than two cities of 5 million or four cities of two and a half million, et cetera, et cetera, in a systematic way. And there's this extraordinary saving um, with all infrastructure, the bigger you are. So in that sense, uh, the bigger the city, the better in that purely material sense. But then we also discovered the opposite for these socioeconomic quantities, the superlinear scaling meant that instead of the bigger you are, the less per capita, uh, the bigger you are, the more per capita. So the bigger you are, the more social interaction per capita, the more patents produced, therefore the more innovative a city is, uh, the more crime per capita, the higher the wages per capita, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that was um, very satisfying because it was not only, it, it was extraordinary, it's universality, because at least in this coarse-grained way, um, there, the um, scaling laws were true across different metrics, quite different metrics, um, everything from GDP to patents to um, um, AIDS cases, um, but also across the globe, uh, primarily across the globe, uh, in most of the, in all the countries that we had looked at at that time. And that was very compelling. That was extremely compelling. And um, to follow up on that, it took a couple of years. We started thinking about theories. It was very clear that this theory, whatever the theory, the extension of the theory in biology to networks in, had to invoke the dynamics of social networks. So we had to understand social networks and, um, the, um, and the structure of social networks. And most importantly, and the biggest challenge is how do those social networks interact with the infrastructure? You can't separate the two. And, uh, and it is no accident that the economies of scale in the sublinear scaling, 0.85 is 0.15 less than one. And that and the superlinear scaling is the same 0.15 bigger than one. And that is, I mean, very simplistically, is because these two networks are interconnected and intertwined. There's a, an integration and a tension between them. So um, uh, that was quite fascinating. And we confirmed it, or at least we, we, we had strong support from it when we um, teamed up with, um, uh, our, our friends and colleagues at MIT, Carlo Ratti's group, um, uh, where he had um, uh, access at that time to mobile phone data and um, billions and billions of these telephone calls. And I was actually, I have to admit, I was quite, I, I was not very enthusiastic. I just thought that was 
not going to be a good proxy for social interaction. Well, this was early enough where, you know, certainly in the United States, um, maybe 50% of the people at that time, now everybody hasn't had mobile phones, but uh, the data we had were from Af some more African countries where there, was, uh, where there was much greater use. Anyway, cut a long story short, what was great is we had that data, we analyzed it, um, a young man named Marcus Schlepfer. Again, he's actually at uh, uh, ETH. He's a, comes out of, he's like you, he comes out of engineering, actually. Um, he, and he did most of the analysis uh, to analyze uh, the, the degree of social interaction as a function of city size. And of course, this theoretical framework would predict that it would, the number of interactions would scale with a, as a function of city size in the same way as all these socioeconomic metrics, meaning a superlinear exponent of 1.15. And it was beautiful. It turned out that uh, the data agreed with that extremely well and all kinds of other things that came out of that data that was very nice. And I became uh, a convert and quite passionate <laughs> about the use of, mo of, of mobile phone data as I realized this was uh, a marvelous proxy for uh, social understanding social infra interaction, but therefore to understanding uh, the dynamics of a city. Um, so uh, that was great. So the, the theory, um, I would say, um, is not on the same basis by a long shot, really, um, but it is <laughs> there, uh, as the biology. But I think enough has been done to convince certainly me and many others that there is a, a theoretical understanding of these scaling laws um, uh, in, in cities and their connection to infrastructure. Um, and one of the things that uh, convinced me early on was the extension, which we haven't talked about, the growth, the growth of cities. We didn't talk about the growth of organisms, but one one of the um, triumphs of the biological work um, was the understanding of, of growth. And that is that um, uh, the idea was extremely simple and it goes to the heart of something you're interested in. And that is that you ask, um, you say, okay, you have this metabolic rate, you have this metabolism, what is it used for? Well, it's used to keep the system alive, to sustain it. So therefore, it repairs damage that's occurred. And uh, you know, if something has fallen apart, you replace it. A cell that's died, you replace it. And then you add new stuff. And you can write down the equations for that. And uh, when you do it, you get extremely good agreement with uh, growth curves for organisms. And a certain universality emerges for growth. Um, and uh, it, it, it was very powerful. And, it's, um, uh, and, and uh, one of its nice things is that it explains why it is <clears throat> that you grow quickly and then you stop. And the stopping of the growth, the cessation of growth um, is related to the fact that the driving, the, the driving resource, um, the supply side is scaling sublinearly. It's only scaling as mass to the three quarters, but the uh, demand side is growing cells at a linear rate and linear beats the supply. The demand beats the supply, so it stops. You can't keep up with yourself, so to speak, and you stop growing. And that's what this shows. That was great for biology, but it's terrible <laughs> for the socioeconomic systems because they don't so, really die, do they? Or they, they they're do, supposed you know. to be open-ended. I mean, that's yeah. our paradigm. So, but what was lovely and what convinced me that, you know, we had it all right, we, we, we felt, at least I felt, was that when you took the superlinear scaling um, and you did the same thing and you formed something that you talked about earlier at the beginning, a social metabolic rate, so to speak, um, and you um, said the same thing, that, that social metabolic rate gets, roughly speaking, uh, allocated between maintenance, the repair of buildings and roads and the repair of people with hospitals and so on, on the one hand, and on the other, the growth of new stuff, the 
you know, growing new buildings and developing new roads and growing new people and so on. If you write that down, uh, the superlinear behavior of what now becomes what we call social metabolic rate uh, gives rise to open-ended growth. And that's what we see. And it agrees very well with much of what we see. And that was great. So it was a very nice package because you would say, look, the underlying mechanism is social interaction, social networks. But what is the nature of social networks? The nature of social networks is that we talk to it, we talk, A talks to B, B talks to C, C talks back to A, and we build on each other. We build up on each other and we create ideas, we innovate. And it is that process fundamentally that creates ideas. That's where ideas come from. That's where the theory of relativity came from. That's where Google came from. That's where Toyota came from. That process and the city is the machine that facilitates and encourages that. That's what's so wonderful about the city. And, um, and so that was sort of the idea that that does it. And that positive feedback gives rise to superlinear behavior because you get the more you have of that, the more you get. And so, you know, it builds on it on itself. And that then leads to open-ended growth. You just keep building more and more. And that was great. And so I was very excited by that. But then I realized the equations had a fatal compound well, or a fatal, a potentially <laughs> difficult difficulty in its consequences. It wasn't wrong, but it had built into it mathematically something that is called a finite time singularity. And that is, that means in English, the following, that um, in some, in this thing is open-ended and is growing, in some finite time, it will go to infinity. That is, you'll get an <laughs> infinite GDP or you'll get an infinite number of patents produced. Don't say that to economists. They no. will love your theory. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that is obviously crazy. That can't be. And indeed, the theory tells you that it can't be because it says if you continue on, the system collapses, it sort of stagnates and collapses. And so you say, okay, and it happens in a finite time. So it might be five years, 10 years, 100 years, but it ain't gonna last. And so the question is, how do you, how do you prevent that? And then it get, we got into some speculations, which it now goes beyond cities. But the idea was simply that, look, you know, that growth curve assumes that sort of the background metric, the background culture is the same all the way through that growth period. So the idea is the idea evolved that we have paradigm. So we have the idea of the Bronze Age, you know, that, that somehow that period was dominated by bronze or Iron Age, iron. And now, or recent, you know, recent times, the Industrial Revolution, coal and steel, and now more recently computers, and then that evolved into the internet. We have the internet age, so to speak. So the idea evolved uh, was, was quite simple in a way that the, the way you avoid it is you're growing within that paradigm. And before you reach the effects of the singularity, you better make a major innovation or a paradigm shift. You better adapt to something new and reinvent yourself and start over again. So the idea was that you would do that and you sort of reset the clock, start over again, you did another singularity and sort of, so the idea was you sort of go through these continuous cycles, which is what we see in socioeconomic system, but this is supposed to be a quantitative theory. And this theory says not just that, but it tells you something that is quite disturbing that you have to do it two things. First of all, that everything speeds up, that the bigger you get, not only do you get more per capita, but things get faster. And that in, in particular, you have to make these innovations faster and faster to, to be sustainable. And when you look at the data, you can predict the speed at which you need to innovate and the increasing pace of life. And amazingly, the data agrees. Now, this is a speculative part of the theory, I think, but it was very compelling. And I've become a, uh, that part has interested me tremendously. 
and I mentioned that earlier, that increasing pace of life and the need to innovate faster. And uh, you, you know, to put it in simple terms, that something, uh, some new innovation might have taken 100 years really to develop a thousand years ago, now takes 15 years. And soon it's going to take 10 years, then take five. You know. So is it conceivable that sort of every five years or four years, you're going to have the equivalent to an IT revolution? Well, that's so that seems unlikely. And we're not, and the other question is can we adapt? You know, we already have that. Can we, you know, is we have I've, this brain of mine, which is very old, I'm now over 80. I've had to adapt to this laptop, to the computer. I have to write in LaTeX. I have to adapt to all those web face things and so on. And it's hard. And, you know, it's a, it's a huge challenge. And this brain that has to do that is the same brain that I would have had 10,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago. And are we coming to a limit to that? To how fast we can, it's not that we can't adapt, but you've got to do it faster and faster. Yeah. That's the point. So that's where I'm at in terms of my, you know, where the city work has surprisingly taken me, that I've become less, and I hate to admit this in this conversation, less focused on, on the city itself you know, what, which was what I was interested in. I'm still interested in, I still work on it, than I am on the consequences, these long-term consequences of the whole process and the whole dynamic. So let's perhaps finish with that then. Um, how and, how and do we- way, Sorry, I, I, do yeah. wanna, I do wanna say one of the things that interested me when you asked me to be on the podcast was that when you wrote a message, I was very intrigued I think you, whether you mentioned social metabolic rate or not, I don't remember, but it was implied was the kind of circular economy and uh -huh. so on, which is of course related to this, uh, obviously. And, and so uh, I was quite quite uh, quite excited and interested about that. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about some of the applications that you, we can do based on this knowledge. Um, into you know the pros uh, the 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 urbanocene as you call it or you know the pressing <laughs> issues that we're having yes. um so i i heard that you want more and more to work hand in hand with practitioners uh so how do we deal with you know we know what is the consequences of our today's cities meaning that if you have more of this today's city this is what you can expect, right? Uh, Sublinearly or superlinearly, depending if it's a socioeconomic one or infrastructure. So that's, we know what to expect. But as you said, we might build different types of cities that might not mm. fit the model or, mm. or we could repair cities. So what is, let's say, your, your takeaway message to, to practitioners based on the scaling laws when we face these global challenges? Mm. A very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, this is the big challenge and I struggle with it, I have to admit. Um, and I may repeat myself in this, but first, <clears throat> one of the questions that's implicit in, in your question is what is the role of the internet? What we're doing now? I mean, the, the, the pandemic accelerated what was already happening so that we interact, you know, we have Zoom talks and so forth, and we're sitting here talking kind of um, two-dimensionally. It's very frustrating, you know, it, it works, and it's, uh, but it ain't the same. I'd so much prefer <laughs> to be with you in your office, to spend a few days a week so that we talk for a half hour here, we write, in, you know, another hour, that, you know, that informality is crucial in you know for has been in any way in the past for developing ideas for being creative and just for living you know and, and we are denied that to some extent by this um, but it saved us and it's great so uh, we're going to get more of it whether we like it or not 
forget about pandemics, it's clearly uh, becoming more and more an integral part of life. And uh, a cousin of that is, of course, the, the much um, touted but somewhat hyperbolic talk about you know smart cities and so on, all of which is good. No, I mean it's good, you know, obviously, but to, to do that, but it's it's so I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, obviously, I welcome it, and I welcome big data, and I welcome AI, but you know, I, I definitely come from a conservative physics background that understanding plays a fundamental role in progress ultimately. Um, and uh, that's you know my passion. And so that goes to uh, the other part of your question, maybe the main part, practitioners and so on. And it's what I said before. I think you know much of what has been done in cities, and I, and I say this, A, from observation, and B, because people who build city, well, build small towns. I've, taught, I've been approached by people who build small towns rather, or developments. And they say to me, you know, you know, basically we just work by rules of thumb. You know, I know lots of architects, by the way, um, who think about these things. And they say, you know, we just work by rules of thumb. This is what was done. You know, we know we should put a park here. We should do this, you know, that's <laughs> you know, we have sort of, you know, there should be this much green and this much that. And so these sort of, well, yes, uh, there's, uh, they probably have some basis, um, but it isn't science. I mean, that's not science. And, um, you know, uh, um, I wrote in my book about, you know, ships that were designed by rules of thumb and couldn't, <laughs> couldn't work. Or, you know, there's famous, famous cases of cathedrals that collapse. You know. Well, you know, uh, we now have some science and I think we need to do it. And we also have the beginnings of an understanding, the beginnings of a theory, of a conceptual framework. And, you know, we're just, as I say, scratching the surface. But we need to integrate some of this with urban planning, um, development, um, urban geography. I mean, urban geography has had some, you know, obviously quantitative science in it, clearly, and urban economics likewise. But one of the things that I'm sure you're familiar with, one of the things I was shocked at when I got into this were these, these different fields with urban in front of them. Um, and they never talk to one another. You know, urban economists, I mean, you talk to urban economists, and they don't, they for sure, but like all economists, they won't they're worse than high energy physicists. They won't, uh, you know, they think they know everything and won't talk to anybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, of course, but you know what I mean. It's, I know what you mean. Um, uh, but the point is that there are these various fields, often, you know, within a, a university, you'll have a department that, um, of urban geography, of urban economics, uh, and so forth, and they don't talk to one another. And, um, you know, this is terrible of itself, but add to that this perspective. I don't know what we, if we want to call it, you know, people talk about the science of cities. Um, okay, but whatever it is, but bringing in some of this stuff of physics of cities, maybe, I don't know, whatever. But we need to integrate all these, first of all, within academia. I think there needs to be a much more inclusive kind of, um, uh, um, kind of framework being developed and more open and transparent. And part of that is to bring in more of the practitioners and spending much more time with practitioners and really trying to get practitioners to work with the kinds of regularities and laws that uh, we understand. I mean, the one thing I didn't talk about, uh, you, I don't know if you're familiar, we wrote a paper last year again with Carlo Ratti on mobility in cities. And we discovered this, uh, we had discovered and explained this extraordinary law for mobility. If you ask how many people, if you take a place in a city um, and you ask how many people are coming to that place from a distance R away and how often are they coming, it goes, there's a simple law that you can actually derive that says it should go one over the distance squared 
times one over the frequency of their visit squared, one over R times frequent RF squared. Um, and it's almost exact. This, this law is ridiculous. I mean, it's even better than the scaling laws. And it's true. And we looked at it in, where did we look? Singapore, Boston. Uh, what's the capital of, um, anyway, an African country. And so there were four places in different continents we did. And it agrees with it. It's, it's extraordinary. Well, you should know that if you're, if you're dealing with transportation cities. So one of the places that got turned on to our work, I think in terms of practitioners, was Singapore. And I've spent quite a bit of time in Singapore. No kidding. Yeah, and Singapore is, a, is unique, of course. So it's a funny place to be doing this because it's an urban system of one. Therefore, scaling has nothing to do with it <laughs> in that sense. On the, on the other hand, the dynamics does. Of course, the understanding where the scaling comes from does, and they got really interested because Singapore is one of the, is maybe unique. Uh, well, it is obviously unique, but its its uniqueness has led it to realize that it's even though it's it's sort of number one in many socioeconomic metrics, it's 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 very vulnerable. Things could change, it could be, so it needs to think carefully and seriously about its future. And um, it thinks it, it, it respects science. So I've, I've spent quite a bit of time talking to people there and trying to interact. And that's been partially fruitful. And in fact, amazingly, in one of their, their five year and 25 year plan, they used the scaling laws, actually. <laughs> to think about. It was kind yeah. of interesting. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's been a problem there too. It's the same issue, the schizophrenia problem. Is certainly there because they because and, and it's very understandable. You have immediate problems you want to deal with when you're a practitioner. You know you can't wait to you know understand and all the rest. You know you got to get things built or whatever. So it's an issue. But I would simply say that we have to make bigger effort to integrate the whole field, to integrate some of this stuff into it, to see the relationship among it. And crucially and importantly, to somehow get practitioners, politicians involved, and also to make it even bigger, to recognize this central role seriously of cities in the future of the planet. And 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 of course, that's where I'm. That's so. Even though that's maybe not where I spend, I do not spend the majority of my time by far working on it. I spend a huge amount of time thinking about it, but I don't do any, you know, but because I think it's so important. But um, so I'm not sure that's very useful, but uh, it's- uh, It's encouraging at least. <laughs> yeah, so. So rapid fire question, what will you work on uh, on 2022 or will you, or any projects, personal projects or uh, professional well, projects? Well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, several things quickly. Um, one is we extended this to uh, universities, which was interesting, by the way. Not gonna... <laughs> uh, secondly, one crucial thing, which I, we did not talk about, is deconstructing the city. You know, we consider the city homogeneously, basically, and that's, that's also obviously wrong. Of course, in core scale, that doesn't matter. But we want to go down to, to you know more fine-grained level, so questions of neighborhoods, and so on. And we've done a little bit of work on that. That's hard. I would like to have, I mean, that's another thing I was frustrated by when I look at the literature. There's no, first of all, there's obviously the ongoing question of what is a city, but I think even more challenging is what is a neighborhood? So we're always saying neighborhood, downtown, and so on, and people, but there has to be an operational quantitative definition somehow. And we, I've tried that. Maybe it's impossible. So there's that, and we've worked on that some. Uh, we've worked on, uh, in terms of deconstruction, inequality in cities, the whole question of, you know, the different layers of people and the scaling laws applied to them. And that was fascinating, I must say. Um, so there's all that, that's ongoing. Um, on the bigger picture, developing a big picture of the Anthropocene. This uh -huh. is what I've talked about. That, that's ongoing. And in fact, I have a meeting following this in about two hours 
uh, of our group, of our separate, different group, um, that is trying to develop a similar kind of theory about the globe as a whole. Can we do it? That evokes it. Anyway, it's, it's very challenging, extremely ambitious. It may not come to anything. We've made progress. We have one small paper that we've written. Um, let's see, so that's ongoing. Uh, the other thing that I didn't talk about that's associated with this, and we have a paper under review in uh, Nature, actually, on companies, on doing similar things for companies and the growth of companies and so on. And uh, that's also very interesting. And it suffers, it's already suffering before we begin from the schizophrenia problem, for sure, or the different cultures problem. Um, you know, I mean, it's so interesting. Economists think, even though they use mathematics quite differently than, than physicists, and we're much more physics oriented. Although an economy, I'm an anthrop one of the collaborators is an anthropologist, actually, uh, who comes and knows a lot about economics. Um, so, um, uh, so these are all these ongoing things, and they're all sort of interrelated. And I'm also toying, even though I said I never would do it again, writing another book. <laughs> as a follow-up somehow. I don't know if I will. It was, I, I'm not a very, I'm a very slow, laborious writer, so I'm not sure I'm ready to really launch into it. And I don't have many, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, <laughs> I don't have very many years, if any, left. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to read it if, if you Right one. Uh, do you have any other books or articles or perhaps even a movie that you'd like to recommend for listeners or, or watchers? Oh, what an interesting question. My goodness. No, not really. I mean, you mean of, um, that would be related to this? Or not necessarily related. Something that spiked your interest lately and uh, you said, oh, that, that was new to me. No, I, I must say, uh, one of the things that uh, has happened to me in the last year, and I know if it's something to do with the pandemic, I'm not reading very much, mm. which is very disturbing to me. Um, and I was a bit thrown by it, feeling almost guilty. And then, this is interesting, people can look it up. I came across totally accidentally a quote from Einstein, who said, you should read less. You're reading too, at your old age, you tend to read too much. One should read less because it, I forget how he says it, but the implication was it sort of pollutes the mind. And that's sort of interesting. And it can, of course, one of the troubles is when you know too much about a subject, it stops you from being creative about it, other than doing something very focused. But if you want to think bigger about it, if you know too much, you can think of all the reasons why it's wrong or it won't work. And that's sort of interesting of itself. So, but what I was going to say is, so I'm not doing much reading, which is disturbing, but this Einstein thing left me off the hook. <laughs> but, uh, no, I've read some books, but I've been reading books about philosophy in America, actually. There's, uh, um, there's a writer named Louis Menon who writes mostly for the New Yorker. He's a professor at Harvard. Um, who wrote a book about American philosophy, which I would highly recommend, actually. Um, pragmatism, it's pragmatic philosophy. Um, but I've been watching, I watch, I'm a great fan of two things. I'm a huge fan of old, old black and white movies, post-war American film noir. Um, Humphrey Bogart type, I suppose, is the image. I love them, even when they're terrible. I just really enjoy them as a relaxation. They're great. I love them. And, uh, you know, the classic ones of Maltese Falcon and Casablanca, they're the genre, but there's hundreds of these damn things. And most of them are not very good, but they're great fun. So that's one passion. The other passion I have that I spend some time on, uh, but uh, is I'm a great, uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about football. Um, in my fantasy world, had I had choice in my life, I would have wanted to be a famous football player, more than a famous physicist or scientist. 
I would, that would have been my choice in life. I did play football and <laughs> I was, I was competent and that's about it. I was okay, but not good enough. That's for sure. So I watched quite a lot of football and uh, too much, mostly the Premier League because I'm English originally and I watch primarily the Premier League. And I have the burden in life, one of the great burdens I carry in life is I'm a passionate follower, mostly because of my family uh, was of Tottenham Hotspur, who are always, who are always failing, always coming close and failing. And I and I and I remain passionate, partly because there's some lesson in life there. Oh, by the way, there is another project I'm working on. Ah, oh, yes, that's related to that. And that is, I predicted the Premier League table not for last, the season before last. I just took the data by simply adding up the cost of the players and their wages and ordering them. And it matched extraordinarily well the Premier League table of, I guess it was 2020, 2020, 2020. I only did one year. And that year, I was better than the 10 leading pundits of the BBC. And my point is, I'd like to write a paper on this to show that the hype about the manager or how brilliant they are and so on is to put it mildly, hugely overrated, because probably my mother could manage Real Madrid or Manchester City and win. And that's my final word. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jeffrey. It was really, really nice talking to you. I hope we're going to meet sometime in the future yes. and discuss about all of this. No, I would. So you're, at, you're in Lausanne, right? Is that right? Correct. Yes, and Celine Rosenblatt is there. Correct as well, yeah. Yes, whom I know, you know, I've known over the years, actually. Not, I don't know her well, but we interacted since she was a student, actually. And uh, funnily enough, I was, uh, she wanted, uh, she was trying to put something together in Lausanne, I think before the pandemic, and I was coming. So hopefully this will happen someday. I will come, or you'll come here, or we'll <laughs> meet some meeting. I would enjoy that. Great, fantastic. Thank, thanks a lot, Jeffrey, and thanks everyone to listening until the end. If you like this episode, please share it with fellow practitioners, with fellow scientists, and just okay. tell us what you've learned, and uh, I'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.